good afternoon. This is George Yates, uh, and I'm here with uh, another edition of Justice for All. We'll be here for the next hour. Uh, uh, having a lot of fun here this afternoon, and I'm really looking forward to our guest uh, today, whose name is Kevin C. Murphy. Uh, he's a professor at the University of the Sciences in uh, Philadelphia, where he chairs the uh, uh, Department of Humanities there. Uh, he is an historian with a Ph.D. from the University of Maryland, and uh, his uh, his emphasis and concentration has been on uh, American uh, uh, relations with uh, Jap- Japan. Uh, and uh, his focus uh, in this book called Inside the Bataan Death March, and it's a story of the Bataan Death March, which in our popular imagination was this uh, – uh, horrific march of uh, captured American soldiers from the uh, southern um, uh, d- district of, of Bataan in, in the Philippines during World War II, and uh, and it's accompanied by you know the whole story of the Bataan Death March is the brutality uh, exhibited by the Japanese towards uh, the heroic Americans who've been defeated in that very early stage of World War II. Uh, I'd like to, and his, this book is a fascinating book, and our guest today is Kevin C. Murphy. I'd like to welcome him to the show. How are you doing, uh, Professor Murphy? I'm doing fine. Thank you so much for having me, George. Well, this is a great book. It's called Inside the Baton Death March, Defeat, Travail, and Memory. And, uh, you, you know, the, uh, why don't you tell our, uh, listen to, or tell our listeners a little bit about the Baton Death March? What, I mean, there's a lot of us that know a little bit about World War II, you know, uh, Pearl Harbor. And uh, then later on, we, we, we fought back and we battled the Japanese in the Pacific. But a lot of people don't really know the history of World War II, the Japanese in the Pacific, and how it all got started, and and the Bataan Death March was a real big part of that early part of World War II, wasn't it? It was indeed. Uh, it really was the result of what the Japanese um, fundamentally needed, which was oil. Uh, the Dutch East Indies was the place that was going to replace the the, um, the supply that the Americans had cut off. Um, The basic problem, of course, was uh, the the Japanese had been involved in China and in Manchuria uh, since the early 30s. There was open war in China since 1937. The United States, uh, with increasing uh, volume, really was insisting that that the Japanese needed to withdraw from China. Um, There was great sympathy in the American public for uh, what the Japanese were, were, what the Chinese were going through and some of the abuses uh, that the Japanese were visiting on the Chinese. Uh, The rape of Nanjing. Uh, made international news, and there was an outcry um, at the governmental and really at the grassroots level against Japan. So in response to this, Roosevelt cut off scrap iron and and oil shipments, without which the Japanese Navy was dead in the water. So one thing led to another. The logic, of course, was uh, after Pearl Harbor, which was the destruction of the only instrument that could interfere uh, significantly with the what the Japanese called Nanyo, or the, the move to the south. Um, the next thing, of course, was to secure uh, the right flank of the move toward the Dutch East Indies, which was to eliminate the American force and the allied um, uh, Filipino army uh, in the Philippines. So, so, that's so, why. so, they, so yeah. they went after us in Pearl Harbor, and De- of course we all know that date, December 7th, 1941, uh, when was the, uh, and, uh, of course, the Americans were on the, this was the Bataan Death March which actually took place in the Philippines, which right. was at that time an American colony. We hadn't yet turned the Philippines back over to be independent. Uh, how was it that American soldiers had to f- found themselves fighting the Japanese in the Philippines that early in the war? And when was it in time? Well, the Japanese invaded the Philippines. They splashed ashore on December the 20th. Um, so this is shortly after Pearl Harbor. <laughs> Uh, they knew, of course, uh, that MacArthur uh, was in charge of the joint Filipino-American force there. Um, it was always understood that war in the Pacific may occur, and the United States, the Department of War, always made war plans on, on a contingency basis. And this was understood to be one of the, the first places that the Japanese and the Americans would come into contact with each other. There was a, an actual plan in place called War Plan Orange, uh, wherein the, uh, the duty of the Americans there in that American colony uh, was to withhold the Japanese for a period of time and wait until relieved by the American Navy and the American forces uh, would be, have enough time to, to come to their rescue. That, of course, didn't work out, but that was the original War Plan Orange, a contingency plan. Now, MacArthur actually abandoned the American force there, didn't he? And they ended up having to surrender 
to the Japanese. It was a what a three month battle. Uh, the Americans held out a lot longer than than anybody figured they would. That's right. Um, they held out for a variety of reasons. Um, although the the American army was poorly organized and and rather poorly led, it was kind of somewhat remarkable that they lasted as long as they did. The force that we're dealing with here, George, was uh, 75,000 men total, only about 13,000 of whom were Americans. So it's really a hybrid force. And you're right, uh, it was a three-month siege. Um, In fact, uh, Ned King, uh, who was uh, in control of of the forces on Bataan after MacArthur left, uh, surrendered exactly on April the 9th, uh, 1942, which is the same day that Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox. And this, uh, failing that uh, event in 1865, this is the largest surrender of any American army uh, in history. And that, wow, that is, that's, that's something. And what, why do they call it the Death March then? What occurred after April 9th, 1942? Well, the Death March itself has entered popular consciousness as this horrific uh, trek uh, during which uh, the Americans and Filipinos were brutalized almost every step of the way. Uh, April is, of course, high summer there in, in the Philippines. Um, it's hot. Um, they've just come through a terrible siege. They are, they are exhausted. They are without hope. Uh, their commander, they believe, has deserted them, although MacArthur did leave on specific orders from Franklin Roosevelt. Um, they are uh, walking along these roads, and while there is absolutely no question that sometimes, on some occasions, some Japanese guards uh, did brutalize these people, um, it's a 65-mile walk. There was enormous chaos. There was a tremendous traffic jam uh, at Balanga, where men are coming in uh, from the west and men are coming up from the, from the south. Uh, there are inadequate facilities. Um, there's not enough waste disposal. Uh, there is dysentery. There are people with malaria. The Japanese guards are confused and confusing. The men can't understand each other. They share almost nothing of a common language. And, of course, uh, General Homma, uh, who is the Japanese general in charge of this, had dramatically miscalculated the number of prisoners he was going to, to in fact, have to deal with. Instead of the 75,000 that he ended up having to deal with, uh, turns out he had estimated uh, the catch only to be around 25 or 30,000 at the most. So we have the makings of just a terribly, terribly confusing and confused uh, intersection of culture, intersection of geography, intersection of mentality. And in that confusion, without doubt, uh, there were brutal acts, um, but I think the book's uh, main purpose is to go beyond that and to offer some context of exactly uh, who did what, to whom, when, why, and for what reason. Well, um, there's a a, a, t- a tone throughout the book. I think you said it very early on. Uh, you, you've spent quite a bit of time yourself in Japan. I think uh, just prior to us going on the show, you mentioned that you're actually headed for Japan again for your 13th trip tomorrow. Uh, you lived in Japan for four years. Um, your thesis for your Ph.D. is on Japan. I don't know if that makes you a Japanese sympathizer, but uh, I think that the tone of your book, is it fair to say that you you try to uh, present the, 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 the whole horrific aspect of the Bataan Death March a little more fairly? towards the Japanese who have been demonized for their role in all of it? I think that's entirely fair, and I think you hit the nail right on the head. The, the existing interpretation of this is very, very simple, um, and it comes from a couple of sources, and it's very understandable why it has come from those sources. In everybody's books uh, who have written at the secondary level about the Bataan Death March, just your, your garden variety history book that you pull off the shelf, the, in, the interpretation is this. Americans surrendered, exhausted, or innocent victims. The Japanese, victorious, were cruel and barbaric captors. And the Filipinos, who were lining the, uh, the route of the death march, were sympathetic onlookers. So really what I've tried to Sympathetic to, do to whom? To, sympathetic to the Americans? Sympathetic to the Americans, Okay. Right. So in, in some cases, uh, the Filipinos, who of course are overwhelmingly Catholic, would refer to uh, what they saw in front of them as, as uh, the American Calvary, 
uh, just as Christ went up the, uh, the hill to be crucified, so these Americans uh, were, were scaling these hills toward their, own, uh, toward their own deaths. So there was a sort of a religious uh, sympathy uh, theme that, that ran through how Filipinos watched what was going on in front of them. Where, where were they hiking from? I mean, I know I guess if, we were, if we were to pull out a, um, a map uh, and, and plot out where on the Philippines were they captured and how far did they have to walk, how long did it take them to walk, where were they headed from and where were they headed to during this march? As the campaign progressed, the American and Filipino army was pressed further and further down into the peninsula of Bataan until at the very end uh, they were perhaps occupying no more than 15 or 20 percent of the peninsula. When Ned King, uh, in spite of specific orders from MacArthur to fight to the last man, which we can come to a little bit later if you like, um, when he surrendered, most of the men uh, who were told to stack arms and, and put their battle flags away uh, were at Maravellas, and this is a small city at the tip of Bataan. And there is a road uh, that runs out of Maravellas uh, to the northeast that goes snakes up Mount Samat. Uh, and when you get to the top, it then drops down and goes all along the coast, along a series of small towns to Balanga and Orani and uh, various other ones, all the way up to San Fernando. So that distance is, is about 60, 61 miles or so. So from that point, uh, the captured men were put on a train, and they rode uh, about another four hours at a very slow speed to a railhead at a place called Capas, where they uh, disembarked, and then they walked the final seven kilometers uh, directly to the west to Camp O'Donnell, uh, which had been a training camp for Filipino soldiers before the war, and that became the holding camp for everybody who was captured during the, the death march. So all in all, we're looking at about 64 to 65 miles with a train ride in between. It's like the in the popular lore when you hear about this death march. That I, I don't know. Maybe it's uh, maybe I'm not the historian that you are. I've, I've always had these visions that this was some thousand mile trek that they had to walk. Sixty five miles doesn't seem. I mean, it's a it's a big uh, it's a bit of a hike, but it doesn't seem like it's that far. Why was it so desperate? I mean, these soldiers. I mean, soldiers can walk twenty thirty miles in a day. Why is 65 miles such a long trek, and why why has this become such a, a, a big thing over the years? Why, why was this such a, a, a big hike? Well, one reason is that the one person named William Dias escaped from uh, Japanese prison in 1943 and made his way back to the United States, and he wrote uh, a fairly detailed a fairly detailed story about what happened to him on the death march. Um, money was running short for the war effort in 1944, and the American government had every motivation and every reason to time the release, the serialized release of the Dias story, which talked about all the barbarism and the cruelty of the Japanese captors, to coincide with a drive for war bonds. So the term, the Bataan Death March, was um, used as a kind of propaganda, Understandably so. We're in, in this death battle with Japan. Uh, there's absolutely no sight. Uh, there's no end in sight at this point of when the war is, is finally going to be over and how are these Japanese going to be overcome. Uh, the war is expensive. And the Bataan Death March was a catchphrase that was used to rally people uh, to, uh, to, the, to the financial exigencies of the war. And it worked. Uh, there were, the British were involved with this, and there were other... Um, stories that, that dealt with Japanese barbarism that were released in the British press at the same time. One is um, a very famous one is the, the diary uh, that uh, somehow made it back to American hands um, of a Japanese soldier who was involved in the beheading of, of several American prisoners. And this was translated and printed in American newspapers, and a great deal was made out of this for, for very effective propaganda purposes. So I think that partly explains... Uh, where the term Bataan Death March comes from, and it bears less of a reality to the relatively small number of miles that these guys walked than it does to the political and propaganda purpose that it had, uh, very understandably, during a war that was very expensive. So it was 65 miles that they had to walk, and it started on April 9, 1942, and it was all right. completed. The last of the, 
American prisoners were uh, at Fort O'Donnell, I believe you call it, as of April 23rd. So it was a two-week hike for the absolute even slowest, most you know, the, the most weakest and uh, uh, pathetic, uh, I suppose, of our of our captives. Uh, but correct. some of the others were, some of them made it in three days or so or less, right? George, some of them made it in, in 10 hours. Um, when you read these, these sources over and over again, and, and I believe that I, I must have hit um, 95% of everything that was written by any survivor of the death march, when you read and read more closely, and, and read again. What you find uh, is that a number of officers and a number of NCOs and other people who were just happened to be in the right place at the right time were driven uh, the entire distance, or at least portions of the distance. The Japanese had captured a large number of American trucks that Americans had not destroyed, and some of these were used uh, to drive up and down the road and simply snap up any Americans who were who were unable to, to walk because of wounds or because of dysentery or because of exhaustion. Um, these are facts that, that rarely show up in any account of the Bataan Death March, that although the Japanese were overwhelmed, there were many, many, many examples of people getting on trucks, getting on buses, uh, getting on various forms of transportation, and being driven 10 miles or 15 miles, or in some cases uh, all the way up to San Fernando, where they got on the train and went on. Now, it isn't possible for any reasonable historian, because the records are, are simply incomplete, uh, to make a guess as to how many of these people actually walked. But I can tell you that one survivor, <clears throat> with somewhat bitterness in, in his tone, said that nobody ever wrote a survivor tale <clears throat> of the Bataan Death March and said that he got on a bus and rode all the way up to San Fernando. You Everybody wants to talk about the difficulty they had and the bayonettings they saw on the way. Riding up to San Fernando doesn't make for a very good story. Well, we we have had a tendency, and I think that the whole purpose of your book, uh, and maybe it's because you've lived in Japan, and and apparently you know it's it's been your focus of your your life in uh, in scholarship, and uh, you're trying to paint a fairer picture of the Japanese people and Japanese soldier who we were forced to uh, to dehumanize in order to prevail in the war effort. Uh, and uh, this was part of the whole propaganda, uh, th- the way to vilify the Japanese. And we got to remember that at that, at that time in 1942, we were incarcerating vast, you know, thousands of Japanese Americans uh, without any just cause in violation of our, our Constitution. Um, and at the same time, what, what, there was other atrocities that we wanted to lay at the feet of the Japanese. Uh, what, the rape of Nanking. Now, that's uh, aren't there other, let's say, besides there's Pearl Harbor, where we have the Japanese who surprise attacked us. We've got this Bataan Death March. We've got the rape of Nanking. What was that? It was in China, right? Right. The rape of Nanking was... And was um, that another, uh, let's say... Uh, incident of Japanese uh, vileness that has maybe been overblown to, uh, for purposes of propaganda? It certainly had a, a propaganda purpose. Um, there's been a great deal of controversy surrounding the, the, the book on this subject by Iris Chang uh, called the, the Rape of Nanjing. And I think there is no question that something like a minimum of 75,000 Chinese civilians were slaughtered. Uh, by a a rampaging Japanese army in December of 37 through early January of 1938. Well, that's the real deal. Chinese estimates of that that slaughter are as high as 250,000. But virtually everybody agrees that there was a Japanese army, that the the Guangdong army was was simply out of control, uh, poor leadership, and um, engaged in, in wholesale rape and, and slaughter uh, on a scale that is, that is hard to imagine. That sounds like something so, out of Genghis Khan. It, very much so, very much so. Well, now, uh, getting, back to your, but getting back to your book, The Bataan Death March, uh, y- your book really tries to deal, you say your book in, 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 in very much part is about memory and, and how these things are remembered. What do you mean by, by that? Memory... I think is, is the key, it really, to understanding more uh, of, what, of what the Bataan Death March was and, and ultimately what it meant. There's the problem here with, with this, and it really is a fascinating problem for a historian, is the problem of sources. There are no primary sources 
for this. Um, virtually all of our understanding has come from other historians reading these accounts of, of you know, innocence and cruelty and sympathy and simply taking what the men who have written about their experience uh, as the final word, something that really doesn't need to be challenged. What I've done here is, is something that's clearly provocative, and, and early reviews have suggested that, that uh, some people are not, um, not entirely happy with what I've done. But what I, what I believe is necessary is to go beyond what is said and think about who is saying it for what reason. Now, the memory of the Bataan Death March takes the form of two sources. One is the trial of Homma, the Japanese general, after the war, where there was a, a fair amount of, of testimony from a whole variety of people, many of whom were Japanese. But the main source are the memoirs or the, the various writings of one kind or another that the survivors of the death march chose to record at some point in their lives. Now, the problem with memory is this. The death march lasted only two weeks. Nobody in the condition that they were in was in, a, in, in any way able to take notes or record anything that a historian would, would think of as a, as a primary source. After the Bataan death march was over, they spent six to eight weeks in a horrific, horrific um, circumstances at Camp O'Donnell, after which they were transferred here and there, some to a place in Manila, some to Taiwan, some to Manchuria, some who worked in the, in the, in the coal mines um, in northern Japan, others worked in various war industries in Japan. So they split up um, after this, and they're assigned these various duties as POWs. Well, that took 40 months. We all have to remember that this is the first real clash between the Americans and the Japanese. It's very early in the war, and these guys have the terrible misfortune of being captured very early. So they spent 40 months in Japanese prisons of one kind or another. They come home. They are, they are embittered. They remember MacArthur uh, as someone who abandoned them. They remember the American Navy as something that never came to their rescue. They remember Franklin Roosevelt as ignoring them in his, in his radio addresses. They, they see themselves as a, as a sort of an enclave of bad luck. They are afflicted after the war with high divorce rates, with higher suicide rates, with job hopping, with various psychological problems. And these guys have a tremendous amount of trouble readjusting to society, very understandably so. What irritates them uh, almost as much as anything else is the peace treaty that the United States concluded with Japan in 1953 made clear that no private claims could be made by any American citizen against any Japanese company or the government. So these guys are looking at years and years, months and months of backbreaking labor that they performed for Japanese companies that they're now not going to be compensated for. So they're, bit, they're embittered. Because they were they prisoners are. of war the entire rest of the war from 19... 19- 42 until 1945, they remained in Japanese captivity? That's correct. They're not freed until September or later of 1945. Wow. How many of those uh, the original, you say 75,000 in our American force? And you said, well, let's see, 13,000, 15,000 of them were Americans? About at the beginning of the campaign, 13,000 were American. At the time of the surrender on April the 9th, we're probably looking at about just an even number of about 10,000 Americans who made the march. And how many, 10,000 who actually made the march, well, 13,000 made the march, 10,000 survived the war. 10,000 made the march. Okay. And about, and about 6,500 survived the war. Now, now, how many Americans died along the march at the hands yes. of the Japanese? How many of these were, we talk about the brutalities and the hostilities of the Japanese. I mean, were there you know, bayonettings and these sorts of things and torture and, you know, the whole way that this Bataan death march was uh, described to the American public. How many Americans were actually killed? Or, and I guess that was, and was this documented during the uh, the trial of Homu during uh, during his war, war trial? It was never documented until a historian uh, named Falk got a hold of, of records on both sides, Japanese and American, 
and made what I believe is the only reliable estimate. We have 10,000 people, 10,000 Americans who start the march. Um, the very best estimates are that 600 died on the march. So we have a mortality of just about 6%. And we can break that down even further, which is uh, something I try to do very carefully in the book. We can come to that in a moment if you like. But the, the fact is that when you read the secondary literature in a whole variety of history books, you see quotes of 5,500 dying. 2,300 is, is mentioned over and over and over again. Uh, a whole range of numbers, very few of which have anything to do with the reality. Of course, once you've decided that the Japanese are cruel, and once you've decided that they're shooting and bayoneting, uh, the number that they, they shoot or bayonet becomes less important than the fact that you're defining them in a particular way in a wartime context. But the right number is about 600. And, and if, you'll, if you'll permit me, George, I'd like to break that down a little bit further, um, because that, that number, while I believe it is very close to being accurate, uh, only tells a portion of the tale as well. Yeah, I want to know how many were actually murdered. I'm thinking what I conclude in the book is that if we had a total mortality of 600, I'm thinking uh, that very reasonably probably 200 to 250 of these people died along the way of exposure. They died of disease um, without any assistance from the Japanese, which really leaves us with a figure of about 350 or 400 whose, whose death we can completely and accurately attribute to a Japanese bayonet or a Japanese bullet. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, uh, and, and you break that down in your book, and you, you have some reliable evidence to back all that up. I do. Where do they come up with this 2,300 to 5,500? That doesn't add up if you've got – I mean, how can people come up with those estimates when the numbers just – You've still got 6,500 survivors at the end of the war, and that just the numbers don't add up. It's, it's fascinating, really. Where the 2,300 figure comes from is unclear, and, I, and I've spent so much time reading this. Um, it's unclear you know, who originally suggested this, um, but the traction is undeniably uh, there. We have people repeating it and repeating it and repeating it. Um, one person cites another who cites the same person, and suddenly the 2,300 uh, takes on a, a kind of a legitimacy of its own. Well, so, but 350 to 400 being bayoneted, and uh, that's, that's still pretty horrific. So, uh, uh, you, you know, we, we, we do have this, that, that's enough to get, a, get some people's, uh, you know, conscience going on that. So that's, that's pretty serious crimes. Uh, and I guess the, the Japanese commander was executed at the end of the war for his role in it. But your book says uh, he was not really responsible for that. Uh, these were... Th Crimes committed by his underlings. You're saying the superior, the supreme commander of these forces, uh, had no interest whatsoever in brutality towards the Americans. Uh, wh wh how how do these crimes take place? You know, George, the Homa, as the Japanese general, was enormously sympathetic uh, to Western sensibilities. He had spent time in Great Britain. He spoke English very well. He spent time in India. He was sort of not trusted uh, by the inner circle of the Japanese military uh, in, 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 uh, in the war councils uh, because he was known as someone who was, frankly, sympathetic to the West. He wrote poetry. He married for love. He was uh, an interesting fellow who was far out of the, the normal mold of, of the product of, of Japanese military academies. He was a gifted, um, a gifted organizer. Um, he was relatively well-connected. Uh, he married well, although at one point um, one story suggests that, that um, uh, a woman that he wanted to marry very much uh, rejected his overtures and uh, only at the last moment did a friend of his, uh, was a friend of his successful in, in dissuading him from jumping out a window uh, because he was, he was so overcome with grief. <laughs> well, these are not typical uh, behaviors of the Japanese, uh, the Japanese military general. So, yeah, he was, he was executed, uh, and, and the basis on which he was executed at the end of the war um, was that he was responsible for everything that the people under his command, in, in fact, had done. Well, um, Homa, after the surrender on April the 9th, was facing an enormous logistical and military problem. The island of Corregidor, 
which was the last American stronghold, the island out there in the bay, just beyond Maravellas at the tip of, of the Bataan Peninsula, was still holding out. And he was completely focused on arranging the Japanese army and the, the artillery emplacements uh, to bring about the end of the campaign as quickly as possible. He was already under enormous pressure from Tokyo to get this campaign finished. It was only supposed to have lasted a month at the most. Now we're pushing four months, and he's completely focused on this. Um, it is unclear the degree to which he saw anything, um, but I think responsible biographers, including William Manchester, would argue that, uh, in part, um, MacArthur, who is, of course, in complete control of this theater of the war after it's over, um, was embarrassed that Homa defeated him uh, in open combat. And MacArthur decided that Homa was not going to be tried in Tokyo in the regular war crimes trial, but that he would be tried along with one other general in Manila under specifically MacArthur's orders. So the, the guilty uh, verdict was a foregone conclusion. Uh, it is notable, perhaps, that uh, he was sentenced uh, to be hanged, and at the last minute, MacArthur at least commuted his sentence uh, to, to him being shot, which is slightly less undignified. Describe for uh, our, our listeners the, the horrors, the actual horrors of the Bataan Death March that uh, have entered the popular culture and the popular consciousness that are, in fact, true uh, in, in terms of what your research has proven. I, there were horrors, George. There, there's no question. There were bayonettings. There were arbitrary killings. There, were, there may have been beheadings. There may have been incidents uh, where uh, one or more Japanese soldiers uh, walked along the, the death march with, with severed American heads on their bayonets. There may have been examples of uh, soldiers too sick uh, to go on, uh, in fact, being buried alive, having been ordered um, to, to be buried alive by, by others who were less sick. Uh, there is a, there is a, a very famous and, and oft-repeated incident where an American uh, who was essentially comatose, um, dying of, of dysentery and, and malaria, uh, completely at the end of his rope, uh, he was instructed, uh, two other Americans were instructed to put him into a shallow grave and begin covering it up. Um, as he felt the dirt coming back over him, uh, he came back to life and attempted to struggle out, at which point uh, the Japanese guard at bayonet point um, instructed the two Americans uh, you know, on the grave detail uh, to beat him on the head, knock him unconscious, and to continue covering him up. I don't doubt that there were some incidents of that kind. And the, the way that those incidents are spun during wartime and the degree to which they continue to provide an interest, a period interest, uh, for readers um, who take pleasure, all of us, I think, take pleasure in going to the horror movie and and, and rejoicing in the fact that those terrible things are happening to someone else. Um, I think we read um, some of these, some of these uh, less attractive and, and, and bloody accounts uh, because we take a certain pleasure in, in knowing that, it, once again, it's happening to someone else. And I think a, a variety of behavioral psychologists uh, would suggest that that's true. I do think we need to go further, though. And what I try to do in at least three or portions of three of the chapters is to say, okay, we, we certainly recognize that some of that happened, but is there something else that we can define as a clash of cultures that helps us to explain how and the specific circumstances of so many of these men's deaths? And, George, what I conclude is that the vast majority of the killing occurred at the water sites. These were not random killings. These were not a Japanese guard uh, just sort of arbitrarily deciding that somebody's walking too slow and running him through with the bayonet, although perhaps uh, that did happen to some degree. Much more important is what I think is a clash of cultures that occurred many, many times, hundreds of times throughout this death march, wherein you have a group of Americans who are walking on a road that is dusty at the height of the Philippine summer, they are thirsty, they are undisciplined, they are poorly led, they are little more than a walking mob, uh, 
They are guarded by maybe only one or two Japanese soldiers for every 100 or 150 of these guys. All along the route, there are fresh artesian wells, literally pipes sticking out of the ground with fresh water uh, from underground sources flowing out. And what happened over and over and over again was the Americans saw this water and broke and ran for it in a pandemonium of chaos, with men stumbling over each other and trampling each other and trying to get at this water in ways that would sustain them. The Japanese, petrified of losing control and culturally predisposed uh, to think of order and form as the ultimate good, lashed out. It must have been horrific for a Japanese uh, to see order and control completely slip away and this American mob essentially uh, behaving uh, in an every-man-for-yourself kind of way. At these moments, the Japanese began firing into the crowd. At these moments, the Japanese began uh, to bayonet. At these moments, the Japanese tried to restore control, which they are absolutely culturally predisposed to do, in the best way that they could. And the result was bloodshed. The result was death. The result was murder. But it was in a context that I think helps us to understand it better as a, as a clash between the undisciplined American individualist, the every man for yourself, and the Japanese uh, who feels outnumbered and absolutely committed to an idea of control and order that is evaporating before his eyes uh, in the most horrific way. There is where the death occurred. Do your critics of your book uh, think that maybe you're apologizing too much for the Japanese and trying to explain this behavior when, in fact, uh, it's really not explainable or it's certainly not justifiable? I mean, you can see that there's uh, all kinds of reasons, perhaps, that these kinds of atrocities would take place. But at the end of the day, you just can't bury somebody alive. So, I, I mean, how is that what your critics uh, sometimes have said about this book so far? They have. That's right. Um, some have gone back and said, you're putting too fine a point on it. Um, it wasn't a clash of cultures. Uh, all we really need to know about this, and, and I understand this point of view, and, and I'm not, um, I am not certainly don't reject it out of hand. All we need to know is that the Japanese were socialized uh, in the emperor system. Uh, they were brutalized themselves, and they, you know, in the context of drafting ignorant peasants, and indoctrinating them with simple-minded emperor worship, uh, how do you expect them to behave? You know, they were xenophobic, they were racist, they were taught that white men were, were impure and a threat to the empire, and that's all you need to know. So, you know, whether they were killed in, in these water sites or not really doesn't make any difference. Um, the fundamental thing is how they were motivated. Right. Um, I'm not entirely unsympathetic to that, but I think we do need to go further, and, and I have chosen to put the, the, the finer point of cultural conflict on there uh, that, that I think some would reject. Yeah, I mean, because in our, in our current culture, and, and like I said, we can go back a thousand years to the days of, uh, of Genghis Khan. We, we referred to that earlier, where, you know, during wartime, uh, the, to, the, to the victor goes the spoils. And so you would, sure. you would have rape and mass murder and genocide, basically an entire societies would just be wiped out at the close you know he would Kong would just kill everybody and, sure. and now in modern society and though certainly in the 20th century and, and 19th and 18th century we, we we got into this sort of you know gentle more gentlemanly warfare where we supposedly are doing it under under rules and you don't murder somebody you don't bury them alive you treat them you know fairly um and then uh and there are certain rules, and, and even now in our current 9-11 uh, culture, post-9-11 culture, we've got this whole emphasis on torture and whether we have the right to even torture uh, detainees in order to get information from them. So, uh, Because if we were ever to hear that Americans are burying somebody alive, regardless of how upset they were or racist they were, it wouldn't be tolerated. So I'm just wondering how you can, uh, you know, as you say, put a fine point on it and – uh, you know, and I'm not saying you're justifying it, but you are trying to explain behavior that, in some people's minds, just just cannot be justified under any, uh, under you know, under any explanation. Uh, how do you how do you speak to them? 
I, I understand, um, and your, your point is very well taken. Um, I, I try to make as clear as possible the difference in the book and in my own uh, sensibilities between an explanation and an excuse. Um, I tried very hard, and, and I hope with some degree of success, uh, throughout the book, never to cross the line to say, well, the Japanese were, in fact, justified in doing this. Right. And, and to stay very, very clearly on the side of, here's why I think this happened in right. terms of an explanation. Right. Now, I will say, George, that... I mean, when you've got, when you've got these... Uh, I mean, how many of these Japanese soldiers were, were even well-trained? And the Americans weren't well-trained. And the... Uh, they probably weren't well supervised, and they didn't know the English language, and the English, the Americans didn't know Japanese. So there was a breakdown of culture, a breakdown of communication, a breakdown of supervision. Uh, you know, it was early on in the war. It, it was just so these a lot of these uh, bayonettings and murders and so on. I'm sure they weren't any anything organized by the hierarchy, were they? Or was they, they were just they were more isolated incidents probably by some of the Japanese, individual Japanese soldiers who then, uh, I guess, uh, herd mentality, others followed suit, that sort of thing. Did you, did you get some of that from your research that this was just kind of incidents that just kind of got out of hand and, and you know, because of the class of cultures and the lack of communication? Yeah, very much so, very much so. You know, these, these Japanese were alone. These guys are five foot one guarding 150 Americans who are 5'10 and 6 feet. Um, they themselves are, are feeling threatened. They themselves are feeling uh, very responsible for getting these guys from one place to the next. They're, they're confused uh, with regard to the orders they're getting. Uh, there's there's countermarching. There's an enormous amount of wasted time and effort uh, on the part of everyone. There's people who are who are told to stop, uh, whole groups of Americans by one or two Japanese guards are told to stop in a field uh, where they sweat for three hours. Uh, and then they, they move three miles and then, and then bed down for the night. It's, it, it's a tremendous amount of confusion. With regard to, to the, the arbitrary and casual brutality, you know, I think it's always problematic at some level to say, well, you know, the Japanese did it, so let me give you some examples of us doing it, and, and then that sort of makes it all even. And, and I do think there are problems with that approach. But at the same time, um, there has been very careful research that has suggested that, uh, given the opportunity, Americans have been, uh, in some cases, as callous and as casual uh, with violence as, as the Japanese were. And I would cite uh, the, what Rick Atkinson in his book, um, An Army at Dawn, has pointed out uh, with very careful research that Americans killed Arabs very casually, used Arabs uh, coming across sand dunes uh, in, the, in 1943 in North Africa as target practice, casually uh, killed and raped Arab women, casually with no sense of, of what the consequences might be, um, firing at camels, um, uh, torturing young boys uh, to get information. So war is nasty business. War is, uh, I think, a circumstance out of which no one comes with completely clean hands. So, again, Americans uh, committing some of these crimes or, or some of these um, you know, sort of arbitrary murders uh, in no way excuses either the Americans or the Japanese. What it does do is offer a context wherein individuals, ignorant without clear leadership and without a great deal of discipline on either side, uh, feel like they can do this without consequences. And that, I think, fits into, my, into the category of explanation rather than excuse. We're with Kevin Murphy. I'm George Yates. This is Justice for All. His book is Inside the Baton Death March, Defeat, Travail, and Memory. Uh, tell us, you, your book is fascinating about its history of Ameri uh, of Japanese culture. You talk about war, and and because you you and I think it's a fair statement you just made. You're not trying to justify this behavior. You're trying to explain it a little bit as and really trying to uh, because I think that you're trying to distinguish between the fact that we used this baton death march as a rallying cry for war bonds, and we used it to vilify the entire Japanese race or Japanese uh, culture as, you know, vile, horrific murderers. Uh, and what you're trying to do, I believe, because you've been to Japan and you understand a little bit about Japanese culture and that this was just, this was war. 
And you're trying to explain the clash of cultures, and it doesn't necessarily allow you just to say, you know, all Japanese or, you know, yellow bastards, like we were trying to say during 1944. We were trying to capitalize on this Bataan Death March. Well, not capitalize necessarily, but certainly use it for uh, to, to raise money for the war. Your Your book talks about war in general, how the vast majority of soldiers – don't even fight. Uh, they 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 hide. Uh, and, and tell us a little bit about your your research, just into war in general and how how it's fought and on both sides. Yeah, it's really really quite fascinating. Um, there's a, a variety of there are a variety of, of very convincing sources. Uh, some that have been compiled by military men, you know, trying to figure out exactly what battlefield effectiveness means and who exactly is shooting what guns at whom and how often. There, the, the astonishing thing is that um, the, there is a, uh, an enormous difference between the way the Americans are fighting actually on the ground and the way the Japanese are fighting on the ground. Lots and lots of research suggests, and this is based on uh, hundreds, even thousands of interviews of American Pacific veterans after the war uh, in a very, very large and, and well-managed social science undertaking, that you know, if these guys in modern war are responsible for shooting at the enemy, if they don't have other people around them doing the same thing, the vast majority of men will not shoot at the enemy. They simply will not pull the trigger. The astonishing thing is that individuals on the battlefield, when they're interviewed about this years and years later, or even months after the war is over, um, they all seem rather sheepish and reluctant to admit that no, you know, unless they were in a firing line or unless they were serving an artillery piece with other people in a, in a, you know, in a job that was already pre, preset for them, you know, they were reluctant to do this. But these guys were astonished to find that thousands and thousands of others felt exactly the same way. So war changes, George, fundamentally between World War I, which had much more in common with the way the Greeks and the Romans fought um, in maniples and, and in, you know, lines of, of infantry with, with long lances. You have lines of men who are expected to go into battle shoulder to shoulder who are expected to go because the guy next to them is going, and that's why they go. It's a, a collective consciousness of either offensive or defensive behavior where you can see other people right next to you doing the same thing. Modern warfare uh, in World War II changes a great deal where ground is taken by small groups of men uh, operating semi-independently of each other, moving along terrain uh, in a very, very uh, sort of sort of interrelated, uh, but but much more subtle way. You don't have long lines of guys running uh, at the enemy the way we did certainly in World War One, which caused, of course, you know, tremendous, tremendous numbers of casualties. M millions of people died in the first two weeks of World War One because of the way we just three. Uh, I think a million people were killed the first three weeks of World War One. For exactly that more than had been killed in all the wars in history, I think we're all killed within the first two weeks uh, yeah. because of the way they massed the armies and just threw them at each other. And that that uh, by the end of World War One, it was being fought a little bit differently than at the beginning of that war. They ran out of people; they just didn't have enough people to fight uh, at, by the end of that war. Right. Well, the tactics changed. Um, artillery support was different. Reconnaissance was different. Much more sophisticated. Uh, and the old ways of, you know, sending up a balloon or, you know, a Fokker or a Bristol fighter uh, to, you know, get some a reading on where you're going to send your, your, your artillery barrage. Uh, this is primitive beyond, beyond belief by, by World War II when, when uh, the mechanics of warfare are much more sophisticated. So Americans um, really did fight in a, in a more sophisticated way. They had moved away on Bataan from the sort of mass tactics. And remember, the Americans are on the defensive the whole time. Well, and Americans have been cut off uh, from supplies. Uh, meanwhile, uh, you say that uh, Roosevelt had, had called MacArthur away from the island. Uh, and you say that when, when MacArthur left, he, he told uh, the, the troops to fight to the last man. Uh, what was the and how could they fight to the last man if they were cut off from supplies and the navy was not there to back them up? Not only did he say that that he expected them to fight to the last man, uh, which was an, uh, frankly an outrageous an outrageous order to to have given to Ned King and, and to Jonathan Wainwright, um, but before he left, 
he issued a, a communique to the Army wherein he made clear that help was on the way, that a, a powerful convoy of soldiers and, and material was there to relieve uh, the, the besieged uh, guys on Bataan. And this briefly raised morale, and clearly, although MacArthur absolutely knew that it was wrong, um, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, earlier on had said that, and here's a direct quote, there are times when men have to die. There is no way that anybody was going to get to the Bataan Peninsula to rescue these guys. It was simply beyond the ability of the American military to do that, Army, Navy, or Air Force. So these guys were left alone, and after it became common knowledge that MacArthur's attempt to just raise their morale uh, was in fact a lie, uh, the bitterness was just, oh, it just, it just crackled out in, in making fun of MacArthur and calling him Doug Out Doug and um, you know, singing derisive songs about him and uh, just became almost a cottage industry to, to invent new ways to insult MacArthur. Now, is this from the survivors of this death march uh, or from other soldiers as well? Uh, the survivors of the death march in particular, right. um, the, the, the reminiscences that they have committed to paper uh, almost uniformly just excoriate MacArthur as, as a liar, as a poor general, and as someone who abandoned them. Tell us about these uh, re reminiscences, because I say your book is a lot about memory, and you've read probably every account of any of the, of the survivors. My guess, this book is, uh, if you've just joined us, Kevin C. Murphy, written uh, this book. Uh, he's a professor at the University of Sciences in Pennsylvania, Inside the Baton Death March. H how many of these survivors actually wrote accounts of the death march? Uh, you, I'm sure you read most of them, if yeah, not all of them. Um, ones that were published as discrete units you know, all bound together under one author or with the assistance of an editor in the neighborhood of 65 or 70. Um, and, what did they, and, and what did they say? What, is, what, are the most me what are some of the more memorable passages from the survivors of this death, death march oh, that you they, think are credible? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, okay. Um, I'll take part the credible part. Let's just talk about the most memorable <laughs> passages. Yeah. Um, some of the more memorable ones... Um, are are they contain verbatim replications of conversations that they have had uh, with other people, um, people who talk about uh, you know poets that they have read a particular verse that that comes to mind uh, that reminds them of of the grave difficulty that they're in. Elegy written in a country churchyard, uh, or quotes from Shakespeare, or quotes from John Milton which they then spin into uh, you know, their current circumstances to somehow explain this. Some men reach for the Bible, of course, and, and think about uh, the 23rd Psalm and, and, and other passages that seem relevant to their circumstances. Um, the, most, the most memorable ones, of course, are, are the really lurid descriptions of, for example, uh, Japanese soldiers would shake down the Americans not in any organized way, but to the victors belong the spoils, and uh, it must have been almost comic to see these little short Japanese soldiers rifling through the, you know, the pockets and the and the storage areas that uh, that these big American soldiers, um, you know, had had right in front of them. They're taking watches, they're taking rings, um, they're taking mirrors, and what pops up again and again in these accounts is that anything that these guys had that bore the mark of Japan a flag or a memento or a pistol or anything that was obviously Japanese, the Japanese assumed that these guys had taken off of the dead Japanese during the campaign. And what pops up again and again is when this becomes obvious that a particular American soldier has been found with a Japanese item, uh, that that person is taken off into the woods and shot, or that person is, is beheaded, or that person is beaten with the butt of a rifle, or in the case of a, of a ring uh, that was understood to have once belonged to a Japanese, uh, the, the finger is cut off uh, to get at the ring. Um, again, this was taken almost like a red to a bull uh, in the ring. You know, seeing an American with a, with a Japanese memento was understood to be uh, a great insult, uh, ultimately really to the emperor, but to the Japanese army, and it needed to be revenged. Kevin Murphy, uh, we've got uh, I've got to we got to leave it there. Is there? Um, I, I'm so we've completely run out of time. We're gonna have to go to a CBS news break in just a second.
Um, thank you so much for being with us this uh, this this day on uh, Justice for All. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. This is going to be then. Uh, I'm signing off. This is George Yates. Come back next week, next Saturday from two to three for another uh, installment of Justice for All. We've been with Kevin Murphy inside the Baton Death March. Thank you, Kevin. And we'll see you next week. Have a great day. Bye bye.